Uh, General Honore, thank you so much for making the trip up from Louisiana to join us for 24 hours of reality. And Sarah's talked about uh, some of your distinguished honors, but I happen to be an Army veteran. I was an enlisted man, sir. Uh, <laughs> so I know a little bit about what it means when, you, when I tell people that you were the 33rd commanding general of the U.S. First Army, one of the most distinguished posts in the Army, because the first one to hold that post was Black Jack Pershing in World War I. And in World War II, the legendary General Omar Bradley held that post. So you, you had some pretty big boots to fill there. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you, after your very distinguished uh, combat career and Army career, uh, you are known to many Americans primarily because of the way you took command of the chaotic situation in New Orleans in the aftermath uh, of Hurricane Katrina. But now, maybe at a time when you were expecting retirement, I don't know, we haven't talked about that, but I know that some poor communities in Louisiana who trust you and believe in you, because they, they know you were what they described as the Category 5 general in the aftermath of that disaster, they called on you for help. And you have gotten involved in some environmental issues on behalf of poor communities. And sometimes when we talk about all these issues, uh, it, it is especially important to get the perspective of poor communities, working communities, who are dealing with environmental issues. And a lot of times people have the idea that if people in a poor working community have their jobs with one of these big polluters, then they're going to be timid about trying to get a solution to the environmental issues. Have you found that to be true? Well, I think you framed the issue quite well uh, because the challenge we have is when we go after the polluters, meaning you walk out of your house, you smell something and making you sick, or your water uh, is colored, or it smells, when the local people in poor communities go to the government, the government said, well, that's the price of a good economy. Oh. And that's what's happening in poor communities. Uh, with a lot of emphasis right now, where we're having a lot of extraction and growth in the energy industry along the Gulf Coast, in Texas, Oklahoma, and even in Pennsylvania, that people are asked to give up clean air for more energy that's produced, much of it for export. That being said, poor people, they take a hard hit anytime we do not follow the laws of the Clean Air Act. Every exception to the Clean Air Act is a direct response and assault on the health of poor people. Mm -hmm. And they, they suffer more than people in other communities. And a lot of times, tell me if I'm wrong in believing this, the poor communities often are ones that have less political power and they have not been able to defend themselves against the location of a heavily polluting industry in or adjacent to their neighborhoods, correct? That is correct. We could go to Mossville, Louisiana, surrounded by 11 chemical plants, and South African oil is about to build another plant there. There are no birds left in Mossville. The water is polluted, and people are celebrating the fact that they're getting another plant that will put 10 million pounds of pollutants in the air and 17 million gallons of hot water a day in the Calcasieu River. And it's celebrated by the city fathers because it's good for the economy. Yet we've got people in the community that are sick from the air and there are no birds in Mossville. In St. Rose, Louisiana, right on the shadows of Narco, Louisiana, a place that's very, a lot of people in the environmental community are very interested in and know about. We got the community of St. Rose, Louisiana. The people have been sick for the last three months going to the doctor because they have eyes irritation, they have, uh, they're vomiting, they have trouble sleeping and living in the community in the shadows of a plant. But you know what? The people of St. Rose are standing up. They formed as a group. They've petitioned the parish council. They've uh, now uh, retained some legal advice. And uh, uh, coming in October, if they don't get automated 21st century monitoring, you're talking about solutions, Mr. Gore, 21st century monitoring. We need that in fence line communities. 
because fence line communities, primarily poor people live in fence line communities. People with money move away. Fence line communities are primarily working poor people, and we need that. And they don't have that in Mossville, in, in, in St. Rose. And we've asked the people in St. Rose, have asked their parish for 24-hour air monitoring. The, the parish said, we don't have the capacity. They defer to the state. The state says it's not a problem. They defer to the EPA. The EPC, EPA said we can't come in unless the state asks us. Mm. So the companies have literally hijacked the democracy. Oh, now say that again. The companies have literally hijacked democracy. How'd they do that? Through political donations and through lobbyists who help write the laws that give them exceptions and exemptions to the Clean Water Act. You know, even in the Gulf of Mexico, all the drilling that's going on, they're allowed to take the production water and put it directly into the ocean. If you drink that water, it'll kill you. If you put it on a plant, it'll kill it. If, if a fish swim in it, it'll kill them. They're allowed to do that today. It's an exception to the Clean Water Act. Throughout the Gulf, we're taking injection water and putting it back into the ground. That water will be dirty for at least 100 years. Mm. And it's full of all the bad things, lead, arsenic, and even diesel in some case. We saw a case in Louisiana this year where the industry wanted to make their fracking fluids a secret as a trade secret. The idea behind that is it was keep the competition from knowing what they're doing. Mr. Gore, don't hide behind that. What they, want, they did not want people to know what's in that yeah. production because it poisons the water. So people are coming to believe in Louisiana that the only one that will save them is them. Mm. Well, because that's a, the democracy has been hijacked. Well, it's a reason for hope that people who believe their employment is linked to these polluting industries are now willing to stand up and fight for a cleaner environment. And what I hear you saying is that there's a change in attitude and people are willing to stand up now. Because people are relating it directly to the pollution in their community. Right here in New York, yeah. a major effort people are making to say, well, we don't want exploration in this county or this place. Right. Texas, the home of the uh, big oil, people are standing up because they don't have water to drink anymore. Mr. Go, their wells have been contaminated. Yeah. We're not making this up. This is fact. Yeah. In Louisiana, go to a place like Bayou Corn, yeah. where a company got an exception to do exploration, and they broke a salt dome. It started off the size of a tennis court, is now 39 acres. Those families had to move. 39 acres? You're talking about a sinkhole? A sinkhole, 39 acres, and those families had to move from their communities because that company destroyed something Mother Nature gave us. It will never be the same. We cannot continue at the pace we are going, with the destruction we do into air and water, and continue to have a sustainable planet. Now, the, the only way we can fix this, and we're going to fix it. And now, first of all, this sinkhole, that's when they came and asked you for help, right? That's right. That is the beginning of my involvement in the evolution of the Green Army. Tell me about the Green Army. The Green Army doesn't have an address, <laughs> and it requires no membership or pledge other than the fact that we believe that we have a human right to clean air, yeah. clean water, and safe food. That no company ha is given an authority to threaten our way of life by poisoning our air and our water. The Green Army is about an idea. Yeah. People in Texas have asked me, in as Port Arthur, one of the most polluted yeah. places in America, and people in Pennsylvania to come start a unit. I said, I don't need to come start a unit. I'm giving you an idea by empowering people yeah to speak up, you start at the local level by basically telling your local government, we smell something in the air and it's having an impact on our health. Yeah. And we want something changed. Because if you don't challenge it locally, nothing will happen. Because at the state level, literally, the big oil and gas uh, own those legislatures in those producing uh, states like Louisiana and Texas. They literally tell those legislators what to do. And the, we do get big help when people can't get reelected again. They will help us try to put a law through. But it started in Bayou Corn, a place that will never be the same. Huh. Well, you're great to respond to the people when they ask for your help. I want to ask you a little bit more about what people can do when money has caused the hijacking of democracy. 
when the use of lobbyists, as you say, and campaign contributions and all these connections and the powers that are running the government are looking more to the oil and gas companies than they are to the welfare of the people they're supposed to represent. That's the situation I hear you describing. Right. People need to go to their legislature. Yeah. We had a community, St. Bernard Parish, go to the legislature and ask for 21st century modern air monitoring because they live in the shadows of a refinery. 18-year-old boy lived three miles from that plant, testicular cancer, directly related to the air that he's breathing. Uh, we almost got that through a committee. Mm. Almost got it through a committee. And then the person from the state that's supposed to be protecting the people came up and said, well, if we make him put 21st century modern air monitoring, it will cost the companies money. Mm. Mm. So we're talking down to people like Heaven money forbid. is yeah. over their health, their profits. The other thing we're doing is Lake Panua, a small village outside of New Iberia where 33 years ago, a salt dome collapsed and created a thing called Jefferson Island disaster. We went to the legislature. We got progress. Progress is being made. The people from that group, Lake Panua, petitioned the legislature. They said, we want an environmental impact statement and be able to negotiate when you do more extraction. We got progress. We got a law passed that allowed them to negotiate with the company to do an impact statement because the state law said they don't have to yeah, do a statement. But we negotiated that through the legislature this year. So there is some progress and it's people. When people act, when people stand up and people understand, the only one going to save them is them. Well, we, we've got to have that kind of determination in order to unleash the hope. But, and it's there, but there, people have got to, to reclaim the democracy. Now, let me ask you more broadly about the impact of oil and gas development. Of course, it's the leading cause of global warming. But if, as we have uh, emphasized during this 24-hour event, there are collateral forms of pollution, some of which cause uh, cancer in the community. One of those areas is referred to as Cancer Alley because of the prevalence of cancer. But we've also seen a, a big impact on the coast of southern Louisiana. When Hurricane Katrina came in and then Hurricane Rita hard on its uh, heels, we saw a terrible impact and there's been more since then. But it used to be years ago that the marshland uh, and the mangroves and the natural barrier would protect the city a little bit more. What has the reckless development of oil and gas had to do with the new vulnerability of New Orleans? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because, again, direct impact of the exploration business is they put canals in to do the exploration. Oh. Then they went back and they put a series of pipelines in to take that fuel out. When they signed the permit to put those uh, projects in, they agreed that they would close those canals. We now have thousands of miles of canals throughout our wetlands in Louisiana mm. that were left open. Oh. So as you get this rising sea, we're kind of like the proverbial uh, canary in the, the coal mine yeah. as, a, as a lightning uh, message to the world yeah. that this is what's going to happen. We're losing our coastline at an enormous rate because those canals were left open and the saltwater intrusion in a place called Port au Chien, Louisiana, just south of Homa. Forty years ago, they used to have alligators. Today, they have sharks. And it's directly related to those canals that were left open that the Louisiana legislature, with, the, with exceptions given to them by the EPA and by the Corps of Engineers, to allow those canals to stay open, have allowed that saltwater intrusion, because that is not just Louisiana wetlands, that's America's wetlands. That's the largest, was the largest wetlands in America. And it feeds into the Gulf of Mexico. And I'm telling you, we need to take decisive action now to restore those wetlands because it makes the impact of storms and has a large impact on the city of New Orleans. Plaquemine Parish, major polluting area. Lafourche Parish, major polluting area. Vermilion Parish, major polluting area. Those three parishes alone 
produce and export much of the energy that comes in and leave America to go all over the world. We have paid a price for this precious thing called energy and petrochemical that the rest of the world needs. Now we need the rest of the world to help us save the Gulf Coast of the United States. And of course, this uh, takes place also in an era of sea level rise. And in the southern coast of Louisiana, like around Galveston, you have not only sea level rise, but the land subsiding. is subsiding, partly because of the oil and gas production, correct? That is correct. And then when, it, when that happens, we lose the vegetation. When we lose the vegetation, we leave that remaining soil. And it change a place where 34% of our seafood come from. So this has an impact on our seafood as well as the impact on uh, the impact of the hurricanes coming in because we no longer have the marsh to, to absorb that initial energy of the hurricanes. This is having a dramatic impact on our, and okay, the Gulf Coast is a destination for a lot of people. 15% uh, of the income in Louisiana is from tourism. So it just doesn't impact people who live in the marsh, it impacts the potential impact on the tourism industry, primarily in New Orleans, Louisiana. Because we see now by models over the years that if we don't do something to protect the wetlands, the coastline will be to the city of New Orleans. Mm. Well, I've seen some maps and some projections that look, look pretty scary. But to bring the focus back to where we find hope in all of this, in order to solve the climate crisis and in order to solve these terrible environmental problems that go along with it, with the cancer causing air pollution, the subsiding of the land, the destruction of the wetlands. And when you say the salt water is invading, that affects people's drinking water in many areas along the coast, doesn't it? That, in, that invades the drinking water supply. It has the potential to do that because the city of New Orleans actually drink water out of the Mississippi River. But we're having a salt water intrusion in our aquifers as far north as Baton Rouge, where two companies, Exxon and Georgia Pacific, use $66 billion of aquifer water, million gallons of aquifer water a day, thereby reducing the health of the aquifer and saltwater intrusion is going into Baton Rouge, Louisiana, because those two companies refuse to use river water. Now, across the river, Dow use river water. Shell use river water. They do it because of the power they have, Mr. Gore, over the government, because they say, well, you want clean water today, you want tomorrow you're going to ask for clean air. Yeah. You said in a speech last week that the Exxon flag flies over the state capitol. It, well, it rotates between Exxon, <laughs> Texaco, and Chevron, and Conoco. But their flags fly over the state. And I say that, we realize that we got here today because of the work they do. We need fuel in yeah, yeah. that form still to do what we do. But we need to transition from that. We only yeah. need to look at the impact of what's going on in the Mississippi River Valley and the estuaries along the coast yeah. to see that this is having a major impact. But the biggest insult to a democracy is to watch the lobbyists hand a piece of paper to a legislature and tell them what way to vote. Yeah. And just look into Washington and see the impact that they have declared exceptions to the Clean Air Act. Yeah. The Clean Air Act is one of the most important acts ever passed by our government to ensure that people would have a right to clean air. And ever since it's been written, every year more exceptions are given in the form of it's good for the economy. My predecessor in the United States Senate from the state of Tennessee, a Republican named Howard Baker, was the co-sponsor of that Clean Air Act. Ed Muskie, from, Senator from Maine, was the sponsor. Richard Nixon was the president, Republican president. It was completely bipartisan, very few votes against it. But we have seen this power in the hands of the uh, petroleum and, and coal and gas industry work its will on our democracy. You say hijack. It's happened in Washington, D.C., too, particularly uh, in, in the Congress. Uh, and so in the time we have remaining, how can the Green Army and how can you, as a man who is admired as a leader, help to rally these people who are ready to stand up to them and take our democracy back? Well, we have a big event coming up this weekend. Wherever right, you are, you ought to participate. Good. Again, the only one going to save us is us. Good. And the government does listen when the people speak. 
Uh, we've had great transformation in our lifetime. Good. I, you can mention many of them. You can mention the desegregation issues. You can mention stop smoking campaigns. All of those have caused a cultural shift. Yeah. I think it's time that we accept this cultural shift that the things that are polluting our air, we need to find a way from not using that at the rate we're using now. We need to wean ourselves off this pollution-based energy source. Number two, we need to look in the mirror. Yeah. We need to look at things that have a profound impact, like styrofoam, plastic bags. You mentioned cities earlier. Cities are taking decisive actions. Yeah. And they're doing it now. They're not waiting. They're not deferring. They're not further studying. Every time we raise the issue in Louisiana, well, let's study it some more. And let's study the impact on the economy. Look, we're the third largest energy producer with the second poorest state. Making money doesn't in, in, uh, ensure that everybody gets to participate in that economy. And it's primarily those companies that shape the policies that prevent everybody from participating in the economy. So, I think people need to act, uh, think globally, act locally. Think globally about climate change, but act locally on pollution. Because the pollution you stop will also have a major impact on our climate overall. Well, I tell you what, closing this out, we started with an agenda of 24 reasons for hope. I didn't expect to be saying at the end of this interview, that there is now a 25th reason for hope, and it's General Russell Honore. And I am inspired by you. We at Climate Reality would like to work with you and the Green Army. We need to take our democracy back, and this new expression of will to do so, and to say the power of money controlling democracy is not going to be the end of the story. The people ultimately can reclaim our democracy, and we want to work with you to do it, General. Three points. We need to do the routine things well. Don't be afraid to, to do the impossible. And don't be afraid to act, even if you're being criticized. Learn that from my public school teacher. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the 25th reason for hope. Russell Honore, thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs>